be here now. Just be here now. We are infinitely larger than the good or bad stories we tell ourselves about ourselves or about each other. Welcome to Healing at the Edge, a podcast featuring interviews, archive talks, and teachings on conscious living, conscious dying with Ramdev Dale Borglum, brought to you by the Be Here Now Network. Dale has been a meditation teacher for nearly 50 years and has been at the bedside of the dying and their loved ones for over 40 years. He was the director of the Hanuman Foundation and founded the first center for conscious dying in Santa Fe, New Mexico. He's taught with Stephen Levine, Ram Dass, and countless others on the spiritual path. Dale is still working with the dying today. For more information, please visit livingdying.org. Welcome, everybody. You may remember the last time we met three weeks ago, I was talking about death as a mirror, and I talked about two clients that I had worked with who have died, one of whom hadn't practiced much at all, and the other one who had practiced really a lot, both in terms of meditation and devotion. And how both of them, though, had come to the place where they felt that their practice had been a failure. And that here as they were approaching death, they didn't have any sense of support. And I really thought a lot about that. I did read as one of the main things we talked about that week, this quote from Rumi. There is a poem in which uh, somebody in the poem said his prayers had never been answered. He never heard anything back from God. Then the protagonist in the poem said, the longing you express is the return message. The grief you cry out from draws you toward union. Your pure sadness that wants help is the secret cup. So that you may remember that in the preceding weeks, we talked about all the seven chakras. And we often mistakenly think that spiritual practice is all about going into the heart. And certainly, the goal of practice is at least eventually to get into the heart and beyond that, hopefully into tantric understanding of the nature of reality and finally non-duality itself. But if one, even though you may have meditated till your knees are about to fall off and chanted till your horse have not gotten to the point where you begin to have some sense of your own basic goodness, some fundamental self-esteem, both from a psychological and a spiritual standpoint, it will be very difficult to bear the vulnerability of the open heart. So today, what I wanted to talk about is receiving grace. Grace is fundamentally a Christian concept. I think that it's also a Hindu concept. I know there are people in this group who are not necessarily devotional. And a little bit later on into the talk, I'll begin to expand the notion of grace to include the acceptance of the empty nature of reality. So that even though we're talking about grace in a, in a theistic or a devotional standpoint, one can be a, a hardcore Buddhist, not have a devotional bone in your body, so to speak. And still there is this fundamental and extremely important stage of practice where we get to the point where we understand that it's not about working harder, trying harder to achieve something, but to receive the blessing that is always here. When we were in India, Ramdas came up with the saying, kind of summarizing Maharaji's teachings, purify and wait for grace. So that grace is available at each moment. And yet when our heart isn't pure, when our mind is too conflicted with psychological conditioning, it is very difficult to 
understand that this too is grace. I'd like to read a very wonderful poem called What is Grace by St. John of the Cross. What is grace, I asked God. And he or she said, all that happens. And then he added, when I look perplexed, could not lovers say that every moment in their beloved's arms was grace? Existence is my arms, though I well understand how one can turn away from me until the heart has wisdom. Existence is the arms of the beloved. So what God is saying here through the voice of St. John of the Cross is that every moment, whether it's a cancer diagnosis or a difficult day emotionally or physically or a wonderful day at the beach with someone you love or a perfect meal or a lousy meal, that it's all grace. And it's, it's, it's difficult. It's so difficult to appreciate that when we look at what's going on in the Ukraine, what we look at what's happening to the planet, that all of this is grace. So how do we get to this place where we can begin to deeply appreciate that exists, existence itself is grace? The definition of grace is the free and unmerited favor of God as manifested in the bestowal of blessings. Purify and wait for grace. So that whether one is a, a Buddhist or an atheist or a Buddhist atheist or a devotional person, we all feel this longing. There, there, there doesn't really need to be a dichotomy between somebody who believes in God and God is raining down grace and somebody who doesn't believe in God, but is through practice beginning to get that grace is not dependent on whether the moment is pleasant or unpleasant, happy or sad, wellness or illness, even whether it's life or death. So as I was thinking about this, I really thought that there are four beliefs, necessary beliefs, that it's so interesting maybe even important to investigate in terms of you or I being able to receive grace. The first one is, do you believe that grace or presence or emptiness is available? The second one is, do you believe that grace or presence or emptiness is available right now? In this moment where, where we're talking, Maybe my, my talk is going to fall apart. I, will that be grace, right? Will, will you liking or not liking the talk, will that be grace? We're not talking about something that's happening after the talk is over and you're meditating, but right now. Is grace available now? And then an interesting question. Am I worthy of receiving this grace? And that many of us in the West have a hard time through all the psychological conditioning, uh, have a hard time believing that we're worthy to receive that grace. The Dalai Lama on his third visit to America said, now I'm beginning to understand and it makes me very sad. You Americans don't like yourselves. And if we don't like ourselves, how willing will we be to receive grace? When I was a, a little kid, going to Lutheran parochial school, I had to memorize Luther's small catechism, which was essentially saying, I'm a poor sinner. I've done nothing to receive God's merit. I'm, I'm humble. I'm no good. You're all great. And if you really could be kind to me, I'd really receive a drop of grace or something. But I'm completely unworthy. I'm no good at all. And the last question then, if you think you're worthy of receiving grace, how does one receive grace? How does one go, go beyond feeling, I have to create this. I have to be a better meditator. I have, to, I have to have more feeling in my chanting of the Hanuman Chalisa. 
Simone Vio said, it is grace that forms a void inside of us. And it is also grace that fills that void. So that's kind of going back to what Rumi was saying, that the longing itself is the grace. Can we cultivate yearning for this receiving and not conceptualize it, not be caught in, I need something, but go into the yearning in a very pure, innocent kind of way. Richard Rohr, the great Catholic theologian, says, grace and mercy teach us that we are all much larger than the good or bad stories we tell ourselves or about one another. Please don't get caught in your small stories. Maharaji said, I'm always in communion with you. What would that feel like if you really believed that? Even if you don't have some connection with Maharaji, maybe it's Christ, maybe it's Buddha, maybe it's pure presence and self. I'm always in communion with you. Swami Nityananda said, be peaceful, I am everywhere. I do admit it is kind of tricky because there are all these Maharaji stories where it seemed like he reached out and really helped people. That there was this guy who was the agent of grace, that his devotee was dying and he gave him a magic banana or something like that. Like I ate the banana and then he didn't die after all. Or he raised people from the dead or things like that. But my sense of it, if I look at this from a wide enough lens, is that whether there's that guy who's doing that, this, this process of grace unfolding is available to each of us in every moment. But that the fundamental quality needed to receive grace that we haven't talked about yet is faith. And whether it's faith in the Dharma, whether it's faith in Buddha Dharma Sangha, whether it's faith in Maharaji or Christ, that as long as you think, as long as I think, I have to try harder, I have to do this, then I think grace is a little bit out of reach. Satya Sai Baba, this, this very popular Indian saint, who I didn't really feel that attached to, if somebody in the room really loves him, I'm not saying anything about him, but he had this quote, grace is proportional to effort. And I'm not sure I believe that. I think it's more unmerited. I think that grace comes because of faith, not effort. It's not what we do. It's, it's the quality of surrender. Which brings us then to the divine feminine. That a lot of people approach spiritual practice as another job. What practices have I done? What empowerments have I received? How many Hanuman chalices have I sung in the last year? And as we go more and more deeply into the heart, the tantric nature of things is revealed that it's all the mother. The mother isn't just the chanting, it's the resistance to chanting. The mother isn't just the chanting, it's the laziness, it's the tiredness, it's the agitation. And that in Fundamentally, the beloved, with the capital B, the beloved can only be everything. So there's this, this notion of having this, this surrendered love relationship with the mother. The mother loves the child completely. I've been reading this book lately by uh, Gregory Boyle called The Whole Language. He's the priest in the hood in East L.A. who developed homeboy industries where he works with gang members. And he, he keeps making this point, particularly to these kids who have been gang members and ex-convicts that he's working with, that God is always love, that you don't have to be a certain way for God to keep pouring love when, when into each of us. When somebody says that we need to be a certain way to receive God's love, that that's he called it uh, theological malfeasance. So that this grace or this, this love is always pouring down upon us. And yet we live in this culture that rewards accomplishment, trying harder to. I mean, 
my son just got into UC Berkeley yesterday. He was so excited. And so now he gets the good education and he can go out and accomplish a lot of things and, and help people and make money, and which is a wonderful thing. I'm so happy for him. So at the deepest level, spiritual healing, whether it's healing ourselves or healing someone else, is not about working with what's broken. It's not about working with the person who feels broken. It's working with the belief in brokenness. Suppose you have a friend who's suffering. Maybe she's or he has a uh, really difficult prognosis. Maybe he or she is having problems in the family. And instead of praying for the difficulty to pass, the deeper practice is to merge your mind with the one mind. Maybe easier said than done, but we've all done that at times. And then merge your mind with the mind of your friend. So instead of saying, I'm here to fix the problem, making the problem real, realize that even what we see as the problem is grace. And that by being in the oneness that manifests and includes the grace, then we go beyond the problematic nature of the immediate situation. I've been around so many people who have been dying, and it is difficult and at times sad to be with somebody who's dying who feels inadequate, who feels unworthy, who feels like if they could only go back in their life, their life and love their child more, or not work quite so hard and love their spouse more. And to be with somebody who's dying who is ready to surrender, not only surrender to God, but surrender their body and their mind and all their stuff is such a blessing. So we're talking about going from conditioning, being lost in the conditioned mind to yearning for love, but finally to admitting that we're love itself, that love or grace or presence is always there. What do you have faith in? What are you willing to receive? What are you willing to be touched by? What are you willing to reach out for? So that this becoming empty, becoming a vessel that can receive the grace, really requires the work that we've been talking about over the past few months of an embodied mindfulness, being willing to be in your body, accepting the support of the earth, the earth mother, being able to be present and grounded and centered no matter what circumstances, what energy is coming at us. If you love God, you overcome all impurities, Maharaja said. If you love God, you overcome all impurities. So that on one hand, we can surrender to this love. On the other hand, we can struggle to fight the impurities. And I was a great struggler. I, When I first came back from India and was living here and, and, and really deeply involved in the Northern California Vipassana community, James Beres and I seemed to have a competition. Who could meditate the longest at each retreat? Uh, till finally I had to have my hip replaced. <laughs> and I, w- I went to the orthopedist and he took an x-ray and he said, you've been in an automobile accident. I said, no, it's a meditation injury. And he couldn't believe it that I hadn't been in an automobile accident. <laughs> okay. Our duty is to fall down in the door where others only bow. And St. Teresa of Lusso said, I fear only one thing, that I should keep my own will. So they're talking about surrender here, complete surrender. And then complete surrender brought into daily activity, not just surrender in front of your altar, but surrender in the traffic. So one final poem, my favorite Kabir poem. Oh, friend, I love you. Think this over carefully. 
If you are in love, then why are you asleep? If you have found him, give yourself to him, take him. Why do you lose track of him again and again? If you are about to fall into heavy sleep anyway, why waste time smoothing the bed and arranging the pillows? Kabir will tell you the truth. This is what love is like. Suppose you had to cut off your head and give it to someone else. What difference would that make? So maybe it's time to cut off our heads and give it to someone else. Everything is a real form of divine consciousness. Please begin by letting your attention come into your body. Receiving, being aware of sensation, wherever they might predominate. Letting go of the need to judge them as good or bad. Just being with a rising and disappearing sensation. Letting the body, letting the mind open, trust. Can you not only be with sensation, but can you have a heartfelt relationship with sensation, possibly bringing your attention to your heart for a bit, so that it's not just clear awareness, but there's a sense of intimacy, a sense of tenderness, sense of compassion when you pull back and you get lost. The longing you feel is the return message. Let, letting the calmness coming from being with sensation reveal the deepest longing. Grace, presence, emptiness available in this moment. Each of us completely worthy to receive Nothing special needed to do to receive this grace other than willingness, yearning. Faith that there is something you can trust that is deeper than any fear that can arise. Faith that you are exactly where you need to be right now.
grace revealing that we are infinitely larger than the good or bad stories we tell ourselves about ourselves or about each other. Grace reveals our boundless nature. Grace revealing that we are loving awareness. Trusting so much that you're willing to cut off your head, let go of identification with thought. Even the thought, just an expression of grace. All presence. I am always in communion with you. watering the seeds of inherent basic goodness. When we can receive, we can truly love. Our duty is to fall down and adore where others only fall. Dying into love, dying into presence, receiving grace, moment to moment, regardless of content focusing on this underlying presence rather than being lost in that which changes. Imagine seated in front of you the manifestation of grace, the beloved Christ, Maharaji, your own true nature, Buddha, the mother. Embodied as pure, radiant consciousness, golden light emanating. Not just the pretty picture in your mind, but feeling the sense of 
grace that comes from being in the presence of pure love, pure consciousness. out of the heart of this being comes a ray of golden light into you that purifies you of any remaining obscuration. Your body slowly transforming into a body also made out of this pure golden radiant consciousness, each molecule filled with pure consciousness, pure love. you made out of exactly the same substance as the beloved. Very slowly then your body begins to move toward the body of the beloved as this body moves toward you. until your two bodies merge. Your body is the body of the mother of the Christ of the beloved. And gradually this body then dissolves into infinite spaciousness. the emptiness that is the essence of the beloved. So empty that there is complete fullness. In this emptiness arises profound compassion for all beings. Realizing the grace even in suffering. Suffering is grace when our heart is truly open. naturally arising wish that all beings might be free from suffering. And from the causes of suffering. That all beings might be able to fully receive the grace that is inherent in each moment. Again, experiencing the sensations in your body is pure manifestation of presence. Beyond effort. So empty of self that you are full.
Uh, there is a question. Okay, from Gail. Uh, I really appreciate today's topic as Rhonda presented it as exactly what I'm working on in my life. I was going to share, but the topics seem to shift. For me, I am surrendering to something I don't understand, something beyond my mental ability to understand. The guru or God, I never met the guru, Maharaji, yet I am practicing surrendering my life to the guru. Thank you, Gail. And in a way, everybody has met the guru. Uh, here we are right now. Joseph Goldstein, after spending a bunch of time with a bunch of Maharaji devotees, said that he must have been a very great teacher because he had almost difficult students. Yeah, it could very well be that those of us who had to drag our bodies to India and get hepatitis and malaria and, and dysentery and all of the fun of 24-hour Indian train rides were the most difficult cases and that Maharaji in all of his forms as Christ and Buddha and the mother and your neighbor and yourself, you don't have to go to India. Maybe all you have to do is look in the mirror. And I know it's, I mean, that's a kind of an easy thing to say. And I feel great grace of being able to be with Maharaji and Ananda Mai and the previous Karmapa and Dujim Rinpoche and Kala Rinpoche and I could go on and on. But at the same time, they say in India that the work of the guru takes place in one moment. That when you meet the guru, your true nature is revealed. And then it's the work, it's your work to bring this into aliveness in a day to day way, to work with all the conditioning and all the opinions that you have that tell you that you can't do that, you're not that. I would be really startled if not everyone in this room hasn't at one point had that experience of total fullness. And the, the deepest non-dual teaching, the pointing out instruction, is that the Lama or the teacher shows you momentarily your true nature, and then you just trust that, you rest there. So it's very much easier than achieving something. It's not like a Vipassana retreat where you pump up your concentration and your mindfulness. Because whenever you find yourself lost, the lostness too is the guru. The lostness is grace. And you're judging yourself for being lost is, is grace. There's nothing you can find that isn't grace. So that wherever you wake up, there it is. And even it's there when you're asleep, even though you don't particularly remember in that moment. So it's profoundly relaxing. So at the root here, it's about trust. Do we trust what I just put into words? That there is absolutely nothing that can ever separate you or anyone from our fundamental nature as freedom as love. And whether there are external gurus or mantras or endless chalices, those are all wonderful things. But eventually they all have to be let go of. We can continue to do them because we enjoy them. But maybe you can enjoy eating a good steak dinner, if you want. You know, I mean, how is it different? So the Dalai Lama, he said, when he goes into an auditorium to teach a workshop or give a lecture, he imagines Amitabha Buddha so big that the whole auditorium is an Amitabha Buddha's heart. And then he goes into the auditorium and what could go wrong because he's inside Amitabha Buddha's heart. So that right now, whether you've been with Maharaji or not, is this all happening inside Maharaji's heart? I mean, I kind of set that up before we got here. That's the way it is for me. And it doesn't have to be Maharaji. It can be whoever 
that form is for you. Any other remarks? Uh, oh, thanks for this morning. It's beautiful. Um, and I've been steeped in the Bhagavad Gita, um, having taken the course that was online with Love, Serve, Remember. And so I, I've been thinking a lot more about karma. Um, and it appears to me that um, I love what Ram Das says about not getting caught in the story, but rather just karma running off. And um, it just helps, I think, me be in, in more presence. And, uh, yeah, there seems to be a relationship between karma and grace. This either if I'm in the field of beautiful trees or I'm with my friend, you know, thinking about karma that seems to open me to grace. I'm just wondering if you could comment on that relationship. It's a very sticky subject that I don't begin to understand. I mean, in one way, it seems very simplistic. You do good stuff and good happens. But at the same time, there's babies being blown to bits or starving to death all over the world as we speak, and horrible people amassing great wealth and comfort. The only way <laughs> that makes sense to me is that we all have to go through everything eventually anyway. That I'm the raper and the rape rapey. I'm the I'm the the uh, perpetrator and the victim. I'm the the good guy and the bad guy eventually until all of it is just God unfolding. And that it's all perceived as grace. I think we all probably have identities that we get lost in. They seem real. We're inadequate or we're good or we're rich or we're dying or we're a cancer patient or we're an expert. And when we get lost in those identities, we get detached from realizing that grace is is, is present. So but the the is available and the karma then is working through that stuff and you know there's so many stories about saints Maharaji stories about him guiding people to let go of these identities to realizing that you could be rich or poor and at, in some way grace was still available you know when when I look back in my life at the things that have been most difficult in retrospect. They were all karma, but in in retrospect, they were all grace. That when Madoff took all my money, when I got cancer, when I hurt my neck, when all these different things happened, they f forced me closer to God. I remember I live in the same town as Jai Utah, and after I lost a very large sum of money with this Madoff scandal. I was in the post office with these very beads. I was saying my mantra, waiting in the line at the post office, and Jai came in, and he knew what had happened to me. And he said, "We sure get closer to God when we're suffering, don't we?" <laughs> he kind of chuckled at me, right? Some of us are stubborn enough that we need repeated lessons of karma unfolding. To the extent we can receive it, it just passes through. One of the secrets or one of the tricks to this spiritual life is how quickly we dust ourselves off and get back on the path after God knocks us over into the mud puddle on the side of the path. My question is about opening the heart and how, how you do that, what that actually means. If, if you could say more around that, because I'm thinking it's um, dropping resistance. to if you're letting go of resistance to something, but that that's opening your heart. Um, I and the heart is it the is it the um, physical place that you're talking about? I'm just um, I have some trouble around that about around knowing if my heart is open or how to open it. Such a multi-level question. We could spend. Uh, a week, week long workshop talking about that, of course, and singing and chanting and doing all kinds of things. I mean, in one way, the heart is the depth of the mind, and the mind is the surface of the heart. 
so that when the mind relaxes enough, when there's no resistance, when there's equanimity and stability, the heart becomes revealed, the heart that accepts, that is connected, that is spacious. In Buddhism, they say this thing that is a bit mysterious, that the essence of the heart is emptiness. And what that means, it's empty of concept, particularly the concept of self. So to open the heart, it, as you suggested, is in a very direct way letting go of resistance. But the resistance comes from identifying with what's separate. So that I'm Dale and you're Yvonne and I'm here and you're there and we're separate at one level. But that's contextualized in this more fundamental level that we're one consciousness, that we're one in God, we're one in grace. And can we live out the separateness that I'm the man and you're the woman and you're there and I'm here, realizing, remembering, trusting this oneness, this, this underlying unitive consciousness, so that the defining qualities of the open heart, it's a warm heart, it's a spacious heart, it's a connected heart, you can use those as meditations. You're going through the day. Does your heart feel connected, connected to yourself? You're not judging yourself. You're not beating yourself up. Is it connected to the people around you? Is it connected to God? Is the heart a spacious heart? Is it one that's not caught up in, in concepts? But you're allowing experience to arise in the boundless nature so that on one hand, we're these tiny, puny human beings, not to diminish the poignancy and beauty of human existence, but at the same time, we fill the universe. We're boundless. And it's so easy to forget the boundless nature because the human nature, the human story is so compelling. My story is the greatest story ever that I've ever heard. It's my story right? <laughs> and you've got your story. And to the extent that we hold that a lot more lightly, the boundless nature of the open heart becomes revealed. Is, is it like your essence? Is, that, is it the essence of you? Yes. That's one way of putting it. Mm -hmm. There are certain practices one does uh, that kind of require an open heart. And I've heard teachers describe all kinds of ways to do that. Remember a time when your heart was open. Remember when your child was born. Remember the time out in nature. Remember when you fell in love. Remember when you heard that piece of music that just brought you to tears. Remember when somebody's suffering broke you open. The Hasids have a, a saying, there's nothing more whole than a broken heart. So it's, it's finding the courage and the root word of courage, core, the French word, comes from heart. Courage is not an act of will. It's an act of heart. Finding the courage to let the heart keep breaking open. When we see suffering, when we see beauty. And that every time we have an experience of that boundlessness, it gives us deeper faith. It's a little easier next time. It's been really lovely being with you all. I uh, really appreciate the opportunity to be with you and to be doing this. It feeds me. Thank you all for being here. 